Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, that was fantastic for a Friday. Um, thank you all for coming this evening for, um, for a, a lecture that's uh, dear, near and dear to my heart and where we're we welcoming Dr. Sharon and Greta Sutton to UNM for the evening. Um, first, I want to thank the people that made this lecture, uh, this event possible, starting with our Dean, Geraldine forbes Sice, who's back there. <laughs> John Qualley, uh, Chair of the Department of Architecture. The Albuquerque chapter of the American Institute of Architects, represented by Jen Fenstermacher. Where did she go? <laughs> and last and definitely not least would be UNM's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, uh, directed by Lawrence Roy Ball. It truly takes a village. So, uh, Dr. Sharon Agreta Sutton is a public scholar who promotes inclusivity in the cultural makeup of the city making professions and in the populations they serve and also advocates for participatory planning and design processes in disenfranchised communities. She has served on the faculties of Pratt Institute, Columbia University, the University of Cincinnati, the University of Michigan, and the University of Washington. She is currently relocated back to her hometown of New York City, where she is uh, serving as a visiting professor at Parsons School of Design and an adjunct professor at her um, alma mater of Columbia University. She, um, Sutton was the 12th African-American woman to be licensed to practice architecture in the United States. The first to be promoted to full professor of architecture. The second to be elected a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. And the first to be president of the National Architectural Accrediting Board. She holds five academic degrees in music, architecture, philosophy, and psychology and has studied graphic art internationally. Sutton's scholarship explores America's continuing struggle for racial justice. Her funding has come from the Ford Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, the Kellogg Foundation, and the Hewlett Foundation, among others. Sutton received the Medal of Honor from both AIA New York and AIA Seattle, and the Whitney M. Young Jr. Award from National AIA. She is a distinguished professor of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture and an, an, an inductee into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. Currently, she is Professor Emerita of Architecture, Urban Design, and Social Work at the University of Washington. That's all really impressive, isn't it? <laughs> Importantly to me, I, I consider Dr. Sutton to be a friend a role model and a real trailblazer. And it's um, people like Dr. Sutton who paved the way for me and um, helped me know that there was a path for me in this profession or the multiple variations of this profession. So with that, I want to welcome Dr. Sharon Sutton to the podium for the lecture. Well, that was quite a welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you, Michael, uh, for arranging this and for recruiting such um, great support. Frankly, this was my agenda for getting out of snowy, snowy <laughs> New York City, where we've had three snow emergencies every other week uh, for six weeks. So it's fabulous to be here and take in some sunshine before I head back to the snow. So this year, I've been uh, traveling around the country. You, you can, you can uh, do the uh, number three. I think we have everything under control. Uh, to introduce my new book and talk about the lessons it holds um, for the city-making professions in these tumultuous times. I'm delighted to say but that I've been having uh, some really great exchanges with various audiences about the book's implications for today. And I'm hoping to have an equally 
provocative exchange with you. But first, let me tell you about the book, which is, of course, entitled When Ivory Towers Were Black. I began writing the book eons ago, shortly after my 65th birthday. Following this momentous occasion, I woke up one morning with the horrific realization that I had never thanked the person who had paid for my education at Columbia University's School of Architecture. It was Vincent Kling, owner of a large corporate architecture firm in Philadelphia. I knew it was Vincent Kling because he had written me a letter saying that he was my benefactor and that he would like to offer me a job after gra I graduated. Fat chance, I thought. I was way too full of myself in those days to consider working in a run-of-the-mill corporate office. Being the sensitive, artistic soul I was, I deserved and got a job with Alexander Kuzminov, a Columbia faculty member who had a small boutique design office in Midtown Manhattan. Shuddering at my astounding rudeness and looking at the file of treasured thank you notes graduating students had written me over the years, I attempted to mend my ways and thank Mr. Kling after the fact. But alas, I was too late. By then, he was 90 years old and apparently disinterested in the amends I wished to make. And yet thinking about Mr. Kling and the free Ivy League education I had received made me realize that I somehow needed to give back my many privileges. After considering various options, I eventually decided that I would tell the story of the 1968 Student Rebellion at Columbia University, which had closed down the campus for an entire summer. It occurred at the height of the Civil Rights Movement and was in part about race relations with the nearby neighborhood of Harlem. I had always believed that this university-wide student rebellion was the reason the school was recruiting black people like me. As I continued my research over a period of many years, I discovered that the student rebellion was only part of the recruitment story. The other part occurred two years prior to these events when the Ford Foundation provided funding for the university to carry out new work in the field of urban and minority affairs. The nearby neighborhood of Harlem was to serve as a demonstration site. Eventually, I discovered that these funds allowed the School of Architecture to mount what was arguably the boldest recruitment effort among the school country's architecture and planning schools. The funds also helped the school undertake ambitious community outreach projects that positioned the recruits as leaders among their peers. The experiment, as it was called, <coughs> defied the commonly held panacea for addressing the persistent whiteness of the city-making fields, which is to create a pipeline into the university that exposes children to career possibilities at an early age. By recruiting a large cadre of black and brown talent, the experiment outed the pipeline panacea as a myth that continues to divert attention 
from the here and now to an ever elusive future. The experiment also defied the off-stated benefit of diversity, namely that the city-making fields should be representative of the American public. From this perspective, diversity is the right thing to do, the charitable thing to do. The experiment instead validated James Baldwin's assertion that black people are essential to disrupting white people's investment in maintaining the status quo. By embracing those who had been excluded from its privileges, the experiment demonstrated that transformation of the status quo, not charity, is diversity's undeniable benefit. This evening, I will demonstrate that black and brown talent is out there if the city-making fields would only change their Eurocentric norms to reflect that talent's experience of the world. <laughs> what made the recruitment effort so successful at Columbia is that it occurred within the context of a radical change in the school's governance and curriculum that was brought about by the student rebellion. To tell you a bit about the rebellion, first let me ask, how many of you are US citizens? Oh, lots of people. How many of you were alive in 1968? Hardly anybody. So, time <laughs> for a little US history. This rebellion took place during the spring of 1968, a year in which protests were omnipresent. One source of unrest was the Vietnam War. As the media documented its horrific casualties, Many Americans took to the streets, especially draft age undergraduate students and their supporters. In addition, hundreds of violent race rebellions were occurring nationwide as ghetto residents lost hope that the civil rights movement would ever reverse the ravages of racial oppression. As the war in the Vietnam intermingled with the war in the ghetto, a rebellion following Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination took center stage, resulting in dozens of deaths, thousands of injuries, and untold damage to property in black ghettos. For sure, the national psyche was running at full tilt during a year that was perhaps even more tumultuousness, tumultuous than the one we are experiencing right now. Imagine a mood across the land that was a bit like today, where every morning you would wake up and say, what the? <laughs> missing a page here. All this national angst was occurring on the Columbia campus with an important twist due to the university's relationship with that Harlem neighborhood, the very neighborhood that the Ford Foundation envisioned as a demonstration site. Racial tensions were at an all-time high due to the university's expansion there, which included an outrageous proposal to build a university gymnasium in a neighborhood park. After displacing thousands of mostly black and Puerto Rican tenants from their low rent housing, which lay in the path of its growth, the university became the locus of a racially tinged town-gown conflict. As it turned out, 
the neighborhood provided the perfect urban development context for the experiment. The student rebellion, which erupted on Columbia's campus not long after Dr. King's assassination, was catalyzed by the draft for the Vietnam War and relatedly the university's participation in war research and by the university's plans for that ill-conceived gymnasium. As a concrete symbol of race relations, the gymnasium proved the most explosive catalyst for the rebellion. One afternoon, thwarted in their intention to enter the main administration building, about 300 students marched to the park and tore down the construction fence. Upon their return to campus, they began a takeover of five buildings, including Avery Hall, home to the School of Architecture. Eventually, the New York City Police Department, with the approval of university administrators, violently removed the protesters. The behavior of the police provoked an even bigger resistance that shut down classes for the entire summer. What had begun with a few hundred students expanded to include about one-third the student body, with its elected representatives calling for the ouster of top administrators, a total boycott of classes, and an end to gymnasium construction. Thousands of students participated in Columbia's liberated campus, attending outdoor teach-ins, listening to a performance of the Grateful Dead, and staging a counter-commencement that ended in a frolic at the gymnasium site. Meanwhile, faculty at the School of Architecture met to discuss a resolution authored by students and staff. The document, known as the May 17th resolution, specified interim rules that allowed everyone to have a say in the school's experimental operation. The rules refashioned the school's hierarchical governance structure as a democratic one, thereby violating a breathtaking number of university statutes. The resolution produced student-led councils that specified a transformation of the curriculum, including a revision in traditional top-down approaches to studio instruction. The Architecture Division Council adopted student-centered learning in four-credit hypothetical and community service studios, all taking place in Avery Hall. The Planning Division Council adopted community service <coughs> learnings in four-credit studios taking place in Avery, as well as paid internships taking place in Harlem. How many of you here have participated in community service studios? Lots of people, because you have one of the oldest um, community outreach centers in the country in the form of DPAC. So that's a really important part of the school. And it's dating back, you know, this exploration of community outreach and this conversation wasn't just happening at Columbia, it was happening around the country in which people were trying, A, to figure out how education could be less hierarchical, more relevant to students' interests, but also how it could better serve communities, especially unserved communities. So this was part of a larger conversation that was just particularly volatile at Columbia because of its relationship with um, the premier 
historically black community in the country, which is Harlem. In addition to the experimental curriculum, the councils made a commitment to recruiting ethnic minority students, staff, and faculty. Their commitment grew out of a widely held belief that black and Puerto Rican professionals were needed to address the ongoing crisis in the inner city. After all, they understood the needs of ghetto <clears throat> residents firsthand and thus with proper education would be best equipped to solve their problems. So you see this is a very different motivation than saying than what we're saying now which is that we should have diversity because the profession should represent the population. This is saying there are people out there who have the life experience to solve important social and environmental problems. And we need, to, we need them in the professions in order to be the best that we can be. A third council, the Executive Council, looked beyond the school to the university and community. An audacious proposal directed to the university president, no less, recommended that all university departments be assessed for their social relevance, insinuating that the process would call into question the need for expansion. If you're not relevant, why do you need to be even bigger? Further, it specified that all aspects of academic planning be carried out with student and community input. And it recommended that Columbia underwrite a resident controlled nonprofit housing corporation. Most audaciously, the proposal pledged the School of Architecture's leadership in offering course credit to any student, any student in the entire university who assisted in community redevelopment work, putting the tiny school of architecture into a leadership role in university community relations. The person who authored this proposal, who was the primary author, was a second year urban planning student who went on to become an academic planner. As far-fetched as the proposal was, as disconnected as it was from the realities of Columbia's power structure, it was extremely well-informed and well-argued. The proposal exhibited the student's superior knowledge of participatory planning principles, community redevelopment processes, and community university conflict and conflict resolution. Some of its recommendations did seep into the school's experimental curriculum, and some Ford Foundation funding did come to pass. Most remarkably, the proposal offered a forward-looking and provocative vision of community engagement that many urban universities, like this one, are pursuing today. So you see, I am the beneficiary of a free Ivy League education. You are all the beneficiaries of a community-engaged education, which has been proven to be more exciting. <clears throat> this vision of an engaged urban university is likewise what made the School of Architecture's recruitment effort so successful. Thanks to the ingenuity of two black students already enrolled in the school and their white supporters, a recruitment process got underway that was one of pure Ivy League bravado. A little smoke and mirrors and a lot of deep-pocketed tenaciousness. Recruitment began in 1968, peaked in 1970, and then rapidly diminished thereafter, which mirrored the emergence and denouement 
of the Black Power Movement, despite their short-lived presence at Columbia. My informants described being recruited as one of the most memorable moments in their education. They told about an all-out search for ethnic minority students that began right after the rebellion with just a head, handful of headhunters and then snowballed as rumors spread about the school's quest for ethnic minority students. As my informants explain, the rumors attracted even more ethnic minority recruits who themselves became headhunters. The recruitment effort was one of the most successful university-wide and arguably the most successful nationwide in architecture and urban planning. The recruitment strategy relied upon grassroots initiative, but it also included administrators' active engagement in conducting interviews, helping with applications, and convincing people to apply, sometimes over an extended period of time. And of course, none of this would have been possible without the serendipity of the Ford Foundation funding for urban and minority affairs. My informant's stories, which are contained in the book, not only illustrate the wide net cast by the School of Architecture in its search for ethnic minority applicants, but they also illustrate the sense of drama, the almost breathless excitement surrounding the one by one tracking down and enrolling of these mostly working class prospective students. A jewel among these breathless descriptions is Calvin Page's detailed account of his initial visit to Avery Hall, which occurred in 1970 after a significant group of ethnic minority students, faculty, and staff were present. I will read his account from the book. <clears throat> when Jim Doman took me up there, like I said, Stan Britt was already there, as was Sharon and all those. But Stan was the so-called head of the black students group there, which was something to say because there were enough black students to actually have a little group there at the time. <clears throat> and Jim Doman introduced me to him because at the time, you almost had to be screened by the black student group. And so Stan and I hit it off very quickly, but he introduced me to all the other principals there that one day. And I mean, this was like unannounced. There were no appointments or anything. I just went up there with Jim Doman, and he was sort of my godfather in that sense of my mentor, leading me around and introduced me to Ken Smith. I'll never forget that Ken Smith was the dean of the school. Introduced me to Romalda Jurgla, who was the director of the architecture program. Introduced me to Hiram Jackson, who was sort of the black on the faculty administration related to the recruiting of blacks. Introduced me to Max Bond, who was the most prominent of all the black faculty. And when I say introduce, I mean we had sit downs from anywhere between 15 minutes with some to up to an hour with others. The most impressive of the interviews was with Romalda Jurgula, who really was gonna make the decision as to who got in and who didn't. I told him that I had worked at 101 Park Avenue, so he was impressed with that. Of course, I had worked with Jim Doman. He was impressed with that. And then I mentioned that, you know, 
I had seen some works of architecture around the world. And you know, he asked me where. And I knew he was an Italian. And I told him, well, you know, I had been to the Colosseum. I had been to St. Peter's. I had been here and there. And also mentioned I had been to the pyramids. And I remember him saying, well, we look forward to, to you coming. So in that sense, what he was saying was, you know, you're admitted as of now, Calvin Page. Lest you be victim to stereotype, I want to pause as I make crystal clear that the recruits were fully qualified to enter the School of Architecture. Many had been introduced to architecture early in life. Some were enrolled in professional programs in architecture or related fields. Others already held professional or undergraduate degrees. Others had teaching experience, including at Columbia. Still others had worked in offices and agencies, and most had developed leadership skills as civil rights activists or in their churches and communities. Once accepted into the program, the recruits equaled or outperformed their white counterparts. 49 of at least 59, and I say at least because I was pretty certain when I was conducting this research that I hadn't found everybody. And sure enough, as I'm walking around in New York, somebody will come up to me and say, you know, you left out so-and-so. <laughs> so, 49 of at least 59 ethnic minority students graduated, with quite a few being the first in their family to earn a college degree. This group received a total of 51 degrees from Columbia, including 17 master's degrees and three doctoral degrees. After graduation, eight earned 11 advanced degrees. At least 21 are licensed architects in the United States, with five being fellows in the American Institute of Architects, and two, having foreign certification. At least two are licensed planners. At least one is a licensed interior designer. At least two are distinguished as fine artists. And at least one is a college president. I want to just dwell on that statistic five our fellows in the American Institute of Architects. There are only about 100 black fellows in the entire university, uh, in the entire nation. And there were five of the 100 from that very short and intensive recruitment effort at Columbia. I find that an amazing statistic. To show the undeniable benefit of diversity, I want to give you a taste of the transformative practices undertaken by this group. Here are four alumni who pursued different career trajectories, but who have in common a commitment to alter the status quo. Carl Anthony, known as the Dean of the Environmental Justice Movement, oversaw the Ford Foundation's global portfolio in environment and community development, and is now traveling the country organizing climate change activists. Robert Arthur King, FIA, recognized for his international photographic documentation of stone carvings on the facades of non-landmark neoclassical buildings is dedicated to preserving the anonymous artworks 
that will be destroyed as neighborhoods gentrify. Mabel Bennett Taylor, a policy planner and former zoning commissioner, is lauded for facilitating the reversal of decline in a neighborhood adjoining Howard University, while also creating educational and home ownership opportunities for the low and moderate income families living there. Roberta D. Washington, FAIA, owner of the largest continuously operated black female owned architecture firm in the country, designed the African American, I mean the African Burial Ground Learning Center in Lower Manhattan, which sparked her interest in recording the contributions of free blacks and African slaves to the construction of New York City. What made the experiment so successful <laughs> in producing these ethnic minority city makers was not just the recruitment of large numbers of students, it was their retention. For example, Today's black architecture faculty number only about 100, with black students making up only about 6% of the population. These figures are a bit old, so it's a little bit better than that. But half of them are enrolled in historically black colleges and universities. Unlike the School of Architecture's ethnic minority recruits, few of these students become architects. Over 68% of black architecture graduates leave the field for other lines of work due to a mix of reluctant patrons, unsupportive majority firms, social attitudes, and low pay. For example, the National Council of Architectural Registration Board, which oversees architects' path to licensure, proudly reported in 2016 that racial and ethnic diversity improved slightly among licensure candidates. However, diversity among newly licensed architects remained virtually the same. Obviously, attrition at the end of the 12-year route to becoming an architect poses a major problem today. Getting more people into the pipeline will not solve that problem. Which leads me to posit with great certainty that one of the reasons Columbia, Columbia's ethnic minority graduates stayed the course and became so successful is that they were not only ones, but comprised a significant cohort. More importantly, their education aligned with their worldview and nurtured a deep commitment to address the inequities they had grown up with in their segregated neighborhoods. The experiment created studios that took them into Harlem to model how the university could meet its moral obligation to make professional skills available to those who need them most but can least afford them. Among the service learning projects the ethnic minority students completed with community groups were a renovated townhouse, a storefront community center, a real estate management institute, best pocket parks, <coughs> housing feasibility studies, plans for a community-owned minibus system, plans for an alternative high school for the New York City Board of Education, publications on tenant rights and tenant ownership, and a cost-estimating course for small minority contractors that the business school implemented. Such projects allow the recruits to contribute to their own community. This immediate contribution fed a long-term commitment 
to socially responsible practice and allowed practically everyone in the cohort to stick it out in a pale male professions. The contributions they have been able to make to changing the status quo of the city making fields and thus expanding their arena of practice are considerable. However, tonight I will focus on the lessons the experiment has for the university. First, is that in these perilous times, higher education, with all its flaws, has a crucial role to play in assuring the long-term success of the resistance movement that is simmering. Change requires the kind of impassioned dialogue that occurred at the School of Architecture beginning in the spring of 1968. The role of the university is to provide the space for young people to assume responsibility for creating anew the values and institutions of democratic society. However, like the revolutionaries who reinvented education at Columbia, students graduate. Thus it is the faculty who are the honeybees charged with carrying forward the ideals, ideas for a new society from one class to the next. <coughs> Not only are faculty society scouts in signaling impending challenges but they can also be transgressors who resist the inevitable return to the status quo and provide continuity for young people to reorganize their world. For sure, the student rebellion at Columbia would not have set fire to the bold recruitment effort narrated in this book had the Ford Foundation not provided funding for urban and minority affairs. The serendipity of that funding yielded resor resources, not only for student scholarships, but also for community outreach, enlivening a moribund school for three years. Yet despite dubious motives, the school's experiment in educational equity has lessons for contemporary city-making education and practice. Above all, the experiment demonstrates that equity is not about bringing historically marginalized populations into an existing institution. Equity requires a fundamental structural change in the affairs of that institution opening the doors of opportunity to historically marginalized populations requires an institutional commitment to recognize and transform the structural conditions that underpin white privilege. To be sustainable, the commitment must be a moral one backed not only by financial resources, but also by intellectual resources, including the vernacular knowledge that resides within disenfranchised communities of color. To be sustainable, the commitment was, must reinvent the Eurocentric norms of city-making education that elevate expert knowledge over personal knowledge and that promote a competitive winner-take-all approach to learning. In its place would be a collaborative approach that blurs the line between university and community and that sees students as the voices of authority in shaping their own education. To be sustainable, the commitment must rethink client relationships that limit graduates' capacity to address problems with broad public benefit. It must include effective 
civic leadership strategies that expand beyond conventional professional roles and services to break the dependence upon paying clients. It must include fundraising, project planning and development research and advocacy. It must include the relationship and coalition building that help public interest projects come to fruition. To be sustainable, the commitment must consider the entire ladder of educational equity, not just the much flaunted pipeline that channels historically marginalized populations one by one through the doors of opportunity. <coughs> it must include pre-professional and evening courses that allow those populations to work while earning a first professional degree. It must include short master's level programs so they can earn advanced correct credentials in just a year or two. It must include a ladder that moves ethnic minority faculty into senior positions so they can assist junior ones in their climb. It must include residencies for ethnic minority practitioners who may not have the credentials to be hired in an academic line. To be sustainable, the commitment must create an amazing, almost breathless sense of possibility while also being brutally frank about the obstacles historically marginalized populations still face in this country. To persevere in the face of reluctant patrons, unsupportive majority firms, low pay, and outright racism. To not be among the many who drop out. Ethnic minority graduates must be better equipped than their majority counterparts, technically, intellectually, and emotionally. A sustainable commitment would prepare its graduates on all those levels. Finally, a sustainable, to be sustainable, the commitment must be forever, which is where Columbia missed the boat. It must track and support ethnic minority alumni after graduation. Feature them in historical accounts. Hire them for professorships and lectures and invite them to narrate their extraordinary life stories. The School of Architecture's experiment in educational equity demonstrates that the continuing lack of cultural diversity in the city-making fields is not due to any of the many reasons found in strategic planning reports. It is due to the lack of will to transform the status quo. I spent a whole lot longer unraveling the story of how I got a free Ivy League education than I ever imagined. <coughs> and even more time figuring out how to tell the story so anyone would be interested in reading it. Yet the real challenge has been in framing the lessons learned so as to inspire transgressive action in today's terrain of unyielding racism and equally unyielding resistance to change. I have hope I have been able to frame these lessons so as to inspire you to assume responsibility for serving the world's most disenfranchised populations. To fashion an experiment in democracy that is ablaze with the spirit of revolution. To become civic leaders who facilitate projects with broad public benefit. To open the doors of opportunity to the black and brown talent currently absent from the city-making fields. 
and to recognize that an expanded talent pool is essential for moving forward in the 21st century. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward. So we can see each other. Yeah. Um, I imagine there might be a question or two. Are there? Any questions? Thank you for your lecture. I'm um, interested in Tasha Howard and I am over in Africa Studies. So you pointed out um, that there is a problem in terms of what graduates face um, once they leave the university. And I think that that also sort of um, Grass's idea about um, changing the status quo and how people sort of rely upon the fact that blacks will face further discrimination once they leave the university. Right. So um, I'm wondering what do you think needs to be done to interrupt specifically that piece of it in terms of um, how do we create not just the students who are going to graduate with the license in architecture, but also be able to be able to engage in work. Right. You know, that discussion came out at lunch today in which one of the students noted that the university was more liberal than the work environment. It's more, it's, it's less focused on the capitalist system of profit from the land. Uh, in fact, some of my students, uh, some of my classmates observed in their interviews the sharp disjunction between go, having this idealistic education and then going out to the real world. And I think the way to disrupt it is to prepare students to face it. You know, how there, there was an article in the Times, I think it was on Sunday, about the additional responsibilities blacks of any income level have in preparing their children to deal with a racist world that it's a reality. And so that was my little diatribe on that you have to be better prepared. You can't change the world, but you can be prepared to confront it, to resist it. And of course, the more people there are in your group, the better it is. Uh, my particular group and cohort graduated at the worst downturn in architecture and and in all of the city making fields, worse than 2008. But they somehow had the, the resources for, and the flexibility. And flexibility was really the name of the game, that if you can't get in one door, you go around and get in another door. And people have to learn those strategies to, to be willing to, to follow your, you know, to, to create your own course. So I hope I provided some insight. It was great to see your reactions as I was speaking. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so Sharon, you, um, you know, this sounded like a really powerful experiment at Columbia, and yet it fell right off, maybe as, um, I don't know, the civil rights movement cooled off a little bit, or maybe people got exhausted. Um, and you stated a couple of reasons why that might have happened. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I, I think of Syracuse, where at least purportedly, you know, they have, a, they've tried a similar campaign um, with mixed results. And can you think of any place that has taken this model, really embraced it, and successfully um, bringing in students who don't appear in other ways. Right. The University of Michigan was the most successful in sustaining a diversity initiative university-wide that I know about, although we were borrowing from MIT a lot of our strategies. And the reason the University of Michigan became the subject of that Supreme Court case that limited recruitment was because they were so successful that they attracted the attention 
of the conservative right. I mean, you know, the, the reality is that there is always white resistance to black progress. We're seeing it right now, that we had two terms of a black president, and now we're having, we're having retrograde. It happened in Reconstruction, it happened after the Civil Rights Movement. So th that, that's a reality. Obama talked about that, that the progress forward is, it's a slow march in which you go forward and then you go back and then you, but there's eventually, there's a there's progress forward. The things that Michigan, you know, I was there for Michigan's transformation. I was there for their student rebellion. As a matter of fact, I had moved from New York City via Cincinnati to Ann Arbor. I couldn't afford Ann Arbor, so I moved into a rural town that had 999 white people living in two and a half person families, and myself. And it was quite a shock. And I, I would sit down on my stairs and I would just cry and think, why did I have this idea of moving out here to Michigan? And um, one day I was at, working at home and a four-hour testimony came on the radio. It was students and fa uh, black students and faculty had demanded a hearing at the legislature and they were testifying about the, their experiences at the university and in Ann Arbor. And the legislature basically said, fix this problem or your funding is toast. And so the pres person who was president resigned. An engineer came in and engineered a solution. I mean, he was amazing. <laughs> you know, the faculty went in one year from 70 uh, black faculty to 140 in one year. You know, there was the will. And there were also inventive solutions. And one of the things that, that we learned is that it was most difficult to change the discipline. So you had to go into other places. So they started doing dormitories, building dormitories that had educational activities and places for faculty to live and sort of alternative learning environments. It was a very successful program, so successful that it became a loss of the, went all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah, but you know, that's the way it goes. I'll be disappointed if you don't ask me a question. Yes. Hi, Dr. Sutton. I was a student of yours at the University of Washington. Thank you for being here. Um, so what are you doing out here? I, I work, I'm an architect in Taos, New Mexico, so we came down for your lecture. Well, great. And um, I'm here. And I am um, curious about the relationships that you had with your classmates, um, how, how those relationships, um, did you maintain them um, through your professional career? And how those bolstered your work? Or yeah, your work? yeah. Well, uh, it was. A, I did maintain some of the relationships. They weren't, you know, you always have your best friends and then people you don't relate to. But we had a sense of being a group. Uh, it was a real um, family environment. Actually, uh, when my second year, I couldn't figure out a place to live, so I lived in the school. <laughs> Therefore had a lot of contact with my classmates. <laughs> um, one of the ways that I earned enough money to, uh, to buy my food was that I ran the, the studio library and coffee shop, which gave me an extra desk. And so I had basically kind of a little apartment there with coffee and, and stuff, so yeah. But we did stay in contact and, um, you know, as the, uh, fellows were, were getting inducted. The first person was this guy, Stan Britt, who was in the, the reading. And, you know, we would look out and try to help the next person get in. I'm, I'm actually the, the sponsor. I'm the second person, and, and I'm the sponsor of the fourth person. So we did look out for each other uh, as time went on. I think the... Um, and, and the whole book started as a reunion 
Uh, our connection with each other was through Max Bond, who was our teacher, um, and, and this person who was noted as the, the most distinguished of the black faculty members. And um, at the 40th anniversary of this event, uh, he is the one that sort of hosted a reunion of the group that really started the whole research for the, the book because he knew all of the various. The university had no idea who, who the recruits were. They had lost all records, but it was in Max Bond's head. So one of the um, things that was important to me was to get this on paper so that it was not just remembered and was something that was written down. But I think we were a pretty close group. And thank you for coming. So I'm wondering, I, I imagine this influenced your ideas about uh, how to teach. Can you give an example of when you turn your classes inside out? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I've always done, um, once I got tenure, I started it, which was at Michigan, I started doing community-based teaching. It's actually really risky teaching because you're not, um, if, if teaching in your classroom, you're in control, but as soon as you teach in the community, it depends on the relationship you've established with the community. And I've had some good relationships and some really awful relationships. I try to figure out which ones are going to work and which ones aren't. Um, so really, it, it, that the whole methodology evolved over time. It was greatly influenced by being at Michigan. Um, because there was this whole, you know, John Kennedy started the Peace Corps at Michigan, so there was a, a um, culture of community service that I was going into that kind of tapped into my memory of this. I hadn't really thought about it, but it seemed right, the thing to do. So I think what has happened, you know, in answer to your question, is that I became more intentional about things that I had been doing intuitively. And sometimes it works and sometimes it just doesn't work. <coughs> yeah. And that's the risk of it. Well thank you once again for sharing this um, really important story with us.